Welcome back to the Rackets Hammer Time podcast. This is number six. I'm Peter Cipriano, one of your hosts. Today, it is my great pleasure to welcome former world champion and all-time legend of both real tennis and rackets, Howard Angus, to the podcast. Welcome, Howard. Thank you very much, Peter. It's a, a great pleasure to be included on this. Um, uh, very, very exciting. Very exciting for me, too, I have to say, as a, as a fellow all-rounder in the squash, tennis, and rackets uh, sports, you're a, a personal hero of mine, knowing, knowing your, all your experience and, and great achievements. So I, uh, well, I don't think I'll ever come t touch get anywhere close to the heights that you achieved. Uh, it's certainly a, a, a bar that was set to strive for, for young players like me of my generation. Um, so what I'd like to do is kick off the questions. I think we'll start from the beginning. Um, my first question for you was, who taught you how to play real tennis and rackets? And when did you pick each of them up? Yeah, well, I started with lawn tennis when I was six and then started playing some squash at nine, uh, rackets at 13 and real tennis at 19. Uh, um, tennis was family stuff in the early days. Um, at uh, rackets, when I started at 13, I, uh, when I went to Winchester, um, I'd played some squash and lawn tennis, and they said, well, why don't you go and have a go at rackets? And I was instantly hooked. Uh, I knew straight away that this was a game that would suit my uh physique and and so on very well it didn't matter that i was short whereas i was already beginning to find it a real problem at uh lawn tennis uh, when i went to winchester i hadn't even made five foot so um uh, i was small and I started with Guy Padrick, who was the um, very, very successful pro at Winchester. And uh, I spent inordinate amount of time uh, on court with him, practicing uh, and learning. Uh, and I heard years, years later that uh, when I went down the first day, he said, well, go into the second court have a hit for a few minutes and then I'll come in and he he, he then came in and, and we hit for a while and it it wasn't a problem for me to get you know rackets balls back into play pretty pretty much straight away I couldn't hit them very hard and didn't know where to hit them but I could at least make contact and he said to the master in charge I found out 30 years later, he said, uh, well, we'll win the doubles with that one. I guess you had a good and, eye and for course, talent. And of course they didn't uh, because um, I ended up getting to the doubles with uh, Chris Green the first year and, and with uh, uh, Clem Sunter the second year and we lost in the final both years. So uh, a, a fantastic amount of rackets uh, all the way through my time at Winchester. Uh, and then uh, I went in the court a couple of times at Queen's uh, before I went up to Cambridge, uh, by which time I was uh, 19. And uh, uh, Brian Church was uh, the pro at at uh, Cambridge. Great character. We got on tremendously well. We worked our socks off um, uh, uh, for years and years and years, uh, long after um, I uh, came down from Cambridge, I would go and, and spend time with Brian, uh, quite a character, quite a character. So those were the two most important people, Brian, uh, uh, Brian at, at, at Real Tennis at Cambridge and uh, Guy Padwick at, uh, at Rackets. Interesting, interesting. Which of the three sports 
did you feel that you enjoyed playing the most if there was one and which did you feel like you were the best yeah at? i've often been asked that because uh, of playing uh, 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 too seriously and 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 squash as a as a and also ran which i loved um and my answer has always been whichever i happened to be playing better at the time Fair. so you know uh, um uh, 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 it's it's unusual for somebody to literally dovetail their uh, 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 their rackets and real tennis um, at the same time and play uh, uh, and just switch backwards and forwards from one to t'other, which mm -hmm. I love doing. I love doing. I I can't believe how these single sport uh, people, whether it's lawn tennis or golf or whatever, how they maintain that, you know, that spark when they're doing it week in, week out. I, uh, I would play a tournament at rackets and uh, get to the end of that and, and say, oh, well, well, what's this? Oh, great. Next week, it's, it's real tennis and, and vice versa. And I love that. That's a great, so I great didn't thing. really feel that um, I had a favorite. Do you feel like you were better at one than than the other? Well, comparative, I guess, to the competition. I guess. Yeah, I was, I was definitely the best uh, in the UK at rackets in the early seventies. Mm -hmm. I didn't lose a a match uh, in the UK for four years. I don't think. But during that time, you know, I lost. Uh, 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 I lost uh, to Willie Surtees uh, a, a, a few times, yeah. uh, and unfortunately, in in the biggest of them, the, the World Championships. Um, so, you know, I was uh, I, I held the world title for for two years, uh, but he had it before and afterwards. Um, but when I eventually got the real tennis. I think I was genuinely the number one for five or six years yep. uh, until I lost to Chris. So maybe I was, uh, I wasn't a stylish real tennis player, mm -hmm. but I think I was the most effective for a while. Uh, so maybe I was better at that. Interesting. So, one of the things I think that you're famous for, I, I would say with a number of us players is the training re regimens. I know with the running and court sprints that you, you had were doing at the time, I know, I think you had said in the past that you didn't do any gym work, but you made an extraordinary effort to get to the courts uh, and do some, I think a, a significant amount of running um, in your spare time. What sort of training were you doing regularly for, for your, for the sports and did the training regimens change um, or were they different depending on the sport that you were focused at any given time? Okay, yeah. well, some technical um, difficulties. Um, my, Howard's gonna answer the question now, sorry. Yeah. My training was odd. Um, I wasn't a gym person. I found that doing circuit training for the squash uh, uh, side at Cambridge, it blew up my knees and my doctor said, well, don't do it then. And <laughs> and I yeah. never did. I never yeah. did again because uh, it was it was it was bad. And and, and my brother uh, was great cross country runner amongst all the other things he could do. Um, uh, said, "Come on, come out and, and and train in Richmond Park, and we'll do some running." And he said, "It'll you know give you strength in the in the final game." And I said, it's making me so ponderous that I'm never going to get to a final game. I'm going to lose in three. Um, and what I found was that if I ran around Queens, the periphery of Queens, once, yeah. my knees hurt. 
really. And bizarrely, I didn't have any problems running for two or three hours on a on a tennis or a rackets court. And what I found was if I went in a squash court and ran up and down as fast as I possibly could and did either 25 or 50 or 100, so 25 for ultimate speed, 100 for uh, ultimate stamina, 50s as a combination, mm -hmm. uh, and if you've done one lot of 50, take a minute just jogging around the court and another 50. Yep. That gave me the kind of speed that I needed for real tennis and rackets. Now, that would not be suitable for a top international squash player, even amateur squash player uh, at that time. Uh, 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 squash is so much more explosive. Rackets and real tennis, you run a lot longer distances, but you're not changing direction with quite the same rapidity. Yeah. So I didn't train at all for squash. I used the squash court to train for the rackets and real tennis. Yeah. And I played prodigious number of matches. We had a great cricket umpire in this country called Dickie Bird, who had been a fast bowler before he became an umpire. And in a um, audio that I uh, had of his, he said that in his day, fast bowlers trained for bowling fast by bowling fast. And I got to the stage where people said, you must be incredibly fit. I said, well, I'm very fit for doing what I want to do, yeah. which is run around a racket court or a squash uh, uh, or a real tennis court. Um, I'm not fit. And I wasn't as strong as physically, you know, uh, as Willie Boone, shall we say. Yeah. But I was I was quicker. Uh, yeah. And that combination of playing up until about 1974, serious rackets, serious real tennis, squash up to county level. Um, that got me so uh, so much stamina that I uh, I could last the pace. I think. Yeah. yeah, I think one 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 of the things for me that my wife always, I guess, criticizes me for is all I do is I like to play, so I try to play four or five times a week. And she, she was always saying, you know, your stamina is always going to be an issue. You're not doing any off court training for court tennis and rackets. I said, Dana, there's a, there's only limited time in the day um, that I have to actually live my life between work, family, and sports. Yeah. Um, and I want to, I like playing more than I like jogging around or, or lifting weights. So I may as well do what I want to do. And I get fit doing it anyway, because I'm yeah. running around doing that. I didn't like, I didn't enjoy doing the court sprints. Yeah. I did it because I knew it helped. Yeah. And not only does it help with, you know, uh, the lungs and the legs, it doesn't do much for the upper body, nothing really, yeah. uh, but it's great for the lungs and the legs. It also teaches you to be inch perfect on your footwork because you've got to get from zero as you turn at one wall mm -hmm. up to maximum pace that you can judge and then slow down again incredibly quickly. Yeah. And you've got to arrive on the correct foot that you want to arrive at, touch the wall just with your fingertips, not pushing off with your hand. And that means you've got to be inch perfect. And I didn't realize till many years later that the uh, the court sprints had helped with that ability to uh, judge the distance to the side wall um, uh, wonderfully accurately. I mean, Jeffrey Atkins, I never saw him push off a wall with his hand. And, and yeah. 
You know, he just always arrived at exactly the right distance away from the wall uh, where the ball was. Yeah. Um, and I certainly think the court sprints uh, uh, taught me, helped me with that, even though I didn't realize it at the time. Interesting. Well, you mentioned Jeffrey Atkins, and obviously you've seen a heck of a lot of Rackets players play over the years. So my next question was, you know, including yourself, or if you want to leave yourself out, okay, who did you feel in that era between, let's say, the 60s and the 90s um, was the best player that you either competed against or saw play? I think Jeffrey has to be uh, right up there. Um, I didn't play as Willie Surtees did uh, right at the end of uh, Jeffrey's time as world champion. Willie uh, Surtees was already based in Chicago and had the, the as I think he said in the podcast, the, the, um, the benefit of playing a lot with Jeffrey, which I never uh, did. I, I, I went on court with him and, and so I funny enough, I was on court with Jeffrey playing in the amateur doubles when I got it. Uh, a ball in the eye and that uh, is one of the few times I think the only time I ever played in a tournament with Jeffrey um, but he it, he was outstanding I mean he was clearly the best for a long while yeah. and there were some bloody good players uh, trying to get at him Charles Swallow and, and James Leonard were both you know, fine uh, British Open champions, and and and, uh, uh, but Jeffrey's footwork was unbelievable, and he didn't hit the ball the way the rest of us do at rackets. In other words, what I mean by that is halfway down his back, his downswing, mm -hmm. he didn't flick the wrist through. Yeah. and lose a bit of control over the head of the racket by that flick motion, yeah. which generates extra pace, of course. Jeffrey maintained the wrist control right the way onto the ball and then just pushed the hand under, still maintaining control. And this gave him phenomenal ability uh, to keep the ball off the off the wood um, so he would be there clearly I have to I wouldn't put myself up uh, in the uh, uh, the leading uh, players uh, but I would have to uh, say that Willie Surtees at his uh, best and I met him at his best a number of times, uh, was the most beautiful hitter of the ball. And uh, he had, I, I think, perhaps the most uh, effective backhand that I've ever seen. Uh, short backswing, tremendously powerful, could put the ball away in a way that I never could, sadly. Mm -hmm. uh, I just didn't have that ability to, to, to kill the ball um, straight up and down. The, you know, I, I tended to work more around the walls, uh, getting the angles. So, Jeffrey, Willie, James Mayo, clearly. Uh, James uh, uh, was a complete unique person, the only person yep. uh, ever to play single-handed or double-handed shots on either wing um, um, and worked phenomenally hard at his uh uh, training and uh, really strong. Uh, and what most of us who have lived through the the male era and the stout era, you know, you 
it, you would just love to have seen what happened between those two if they were both at their very best. Yeah, it's one of those questions like saying, you know, um, would X at lawn tennis have beaten Y? And, and, and you can't. You can't prove it one way or the other, uh, yeah. and, and, and it, but it's a fun debate. Uh, so yeah. those those four, I would put, uh, I would put at the top of my list. That's a very fair answer. I think one of the things that I was really interested to hear about from Willie, and I'd like to hear from you as well. How do you feel, and how how did the game change when they did the switch from the non-reinforced rackets to the reinforced like the extra tech racket and how did the game change when they switched from the gut strings to the nylon was it a dramatic shift in the pace of play and the style of play yeah yes um if you take the racket uh uh the addition of the um the reinforcing the gray material Yep. Uh, in the laminates, uh, which is rather oddly called leatheroid, and God knows why, uh, but that's what that material is. And it's uh, a, a wood fibre material to meet the, the regulations. That strengthened up the frame substantially. And that meant that uh, the racket itself could withstand the much, much higher tensions that the nylon uh, allowed. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I had to switch from gut to nylon uh, on the Wednesday of my second leg playing with his 30s. I heard, yes. Yeah. All controversial. Uh, I took I took out six rackets strung and six lots of guts in a gut in a uh, a sealed uh, tin with sellotape so the air couldn't get into the tin. And by Wednesday, the the temperature on the Tuesday was fifty two degrees below freezing, and the court uh, uh, was incredibly uh, hot. The mm -hmm. club. And all my all my gut just disintegrated uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and uh, 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 I said to, to to Jack the pro, "Could you restring them?" And he said, "Well, I got I can't string them with night with gut. I haven't got any." Yeah. So I said, "Well, I'll have to have nylon," and this I made one of the biggest sporting mistakes of my life. He said, do you like them strung tight? And I said, no, because I can't afford to have them tight. Uh, you know, they, they will, they'll break. And he strung them up. And what I should have said to him was, look, give me half a dozen rackets from slackish to very, very tight, and let yep. me try it out. And, yep. and the hitting of the ball was very, very different. Yeah. When you came from gut with the gut, it, 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 it gave much more. Right. And you could hold the ball on the strings more. Therefore, you could generate a huge amount of cut without necessarily fantastic pace. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was made the serving very different. When I uh, went into the match on the Saturday against uh, Willie, um, my rackets were, you could hear how much slacker they were than Willie's, mm -hmm. who liked them pretty tight. And what I found was that the strings were moving as I hit the ball. That's tough. That's and, 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 and therefore, you know, I was having to sort of uh, pull the strings uh, 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 between points, etc. So that was pretty, uh, 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 pretty disastrous. So you've got to learn that you you don't try and hold the ball on the strings so long with the uh, the new nylon. And then in two thousand and 
four, I think, I worked with um, the string manufacturer. To, uh, uh, we were having terrible problems with the uh, the nylon, mm -hmm. uh, which was called from tennis at that stage. And the guy running the, uh, the company said, to me, I, he came to Queens, and I showed him what was uh, happening. All this, all the nylon was breaking, and he um, he said, I, "I thought that it was wearing out very, very quickly." I said, "No, it's just snapping. snapping yeah. It's just snapping when we uh, 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 when we string." I mean, uh, uh, Andrew Lance would string up six rackets, and and after five minutes, they'd all broken. I've been having that problem lately, but that's probably so just because I'm not hitting me, down the middle. I, I am gonna, uh, I am gonna produce a new string for you. Yeah, uh, and that string is even more resilient than the old front tennis, and therefore the rackets can be strung substantially tighter. Mm -hmm. You. Uh, um, they will, it, the, the nylon will wear out, uh, but it doesn't break uh, first time out as much as it used to. Mm -hmm. And uh, that has caused the biggest change in the game. Uh, uh, the very fact that people can hit the ball so much harder than yeah. they could, uh, uh, shall we say, in uh, the late 60s, early 70s, added to which the ball has got faster too. Yep, yep. And uh, we're working incredibly hard at the moment to try to get uh, a, a, a new ball uh, that uh, um, meets all the requirements and Chicago are producing balls and we're looking at it here and we have uh, some uh, all uh, plastic balls um, which are so close to what we want. It's unbelievably close mm -hmm. to what we want, but it's not 100%. Yep. So speed is what dominates now. Yep. If you took somebody like Jeffrey or James Leonard, their ability to hit intelligent angles uh, was tremendous. And now there is a time, you'll see it, uh, and we've devised a new word for it in the last couple of years we've all heard of hammer serves yep and i came up with the term well people now just do hammer shots in the middle of the rallies yep so uh i said you know they're they're rally hammers yep and um it was said to me, well, why don't we call it a, a, a rammer? And I think it's great because it's onomatopoeic. I mean, a rammer and, and you know, the likes of the, the, the really big hitters will simply say, I'm going to hit this ball so bloody hard that nobody is catching up. It's going to come off the back wall and nobody is going to catch up with it. Yep. And that has come into the game. And I personally feel that you've got to be very careful these days in not sacrificing accuracy for pace, just yeah. pace, pace, pace. I still believe that um, people should be putting the ball away, not smashing it so hard that people can't catch up with it. Yeah, I agree. I think as a student of James Stout, that's all he preaches is, is hitting proper length and cut and width and not over hitting. And I think that's the, that's the correct way to play. And Will, yeah. I think Willie agreed. Um, we're moving on. You'd mentioned a few more people. Um, 
I, I would assume that I know the answer to this and most of the audience would, but what would you consider to be your most satisfying and or best win in the game of rackets? Well, I think it has to be managing to get past uh, Willie Surtees in Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, I'd had a phenomenal trip to the States. Uh, I'd gone over and played in the tuxedo gold racket, and I won the tuxedo gold racket at racket, so I think I was beaten in the semi-final uh, of the tennis by Peter Bostwick, I think. And they said, are you going to play in the Nationals? Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah, we got that up in Boston in 10 days' time. And they said, no, 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 not the rackets, the tennis. And I said, oh, I didn't know the national tennis was on. No, I didn't enter. They said, oh, we haven't done the draw. Do you want to play? And I, I was two weeks away from the world rackets. But because I was used to going backwards and forwards, I thought, well, I'll get so much exercise playing in the nationals. And I managed, I played it, and we also set up a, a, a sort of Bathurst Cup international. So I played... 35 sets against the best players in the world in a week, yeah. including uh, a five-set win against uh, Jimmy Bostwick, who was the world champion yeah. in the semi-final, and a three-love win against Peter Bostwick in the final. Uh, uh, and I thought that was my best win at real tennis till I found out chatting to Peter 30 years later that he'd had an absolutely devastating ice hockey match the night before. It was in, of course, being the superlative uh, character he is, he never mentioned it at the time. And we laughed about it when we met a few years ago. Um, but we then went up to Boston to play the rackets. And after the 35 sets in seven days, I needed three days to recover because mm -hmm. uh, I'd never had a week like that before. And after that, if you'd said run through the wall, I could have run through the wall. I felt I could run through the wall. You know, I felt yeah. incredibly strong. And and Willie and I got to the – Willie searches and I got the final uh, the Saturday before we were due to play the first leg. And uh, he'd been training really hard at, at squash. And he tried to cut in – across in front of me instead of maybe coming behind me and ran into my follow through on my on my backhand and cut himself here mm -hmm. and he needed to go off and they didn't put stitches in they just put one of those tapes on and so the match was it was in the first game yeah so i uh if it had been if i'd been too love and 10-6 up, uh, I'd have accepted the match because it, it, he said straight away, you know, Howard, not your fault. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I've been playing squash and I was just a bit too close. Yep. Ran through. But it was in the first game. So I said, you know, why don't we say that whoever wins next week end uh, uh, takes the Nationals? which I thought was a, a fair solution. Yeah. And, of course, I didn't expect, having lost to him for love the previous year, uh, uh, I, I didn't expect necessarily to win it. But I, um, that's the only time in the World Championship I did actually beat him. So winning the World Championship was something that I uh, had worked at for a long while. So that has to be... Um, the most satisfying yeah one of the people that you haven't mentioned yet is gene scott um and i at the racket club in the pell room which is the the room behind the east court uh, behind the data on there's a picture of you and gene and he's towering, <laughs> towering over you at like yeah. six foot four you know you're yourself I and he's I think if he put his arm stretch. out like this, I could have walked straight under. You know, yep. he was a consummate athlete. Uh, I mean, uh, he got more letters for Yale than any person has ever done, I think. Yep. Uh, he was a high jump champion without 
working hard at it, etc. And I found out from Wayne Davis years and years and years after I uh, we both stopped uh, uh, playing seriously that Gene said to Wayne, I want to see how good I can get at this game without really learning the stroke. Just using his 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 lawn tennis, yep. you know. I mean, he was a, 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 a semi-finalist at Forest Hills, and he was a great tennis player. And six foot four, unbelievable uh, um, coverage. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, not running coverage, but reach coverage. Yep. And uh, I remember in a eliminator with him uh, in New York. Uh, I got off court not having had a good day. And uh, my wife, Judy, and Willie Surtees said, Howard, why did you go on and on and on trying to blast it past him into the grill? Why didn't you go across court down to the winning gallery area? Yeah. Well, I had been playing real tennis at that stage for 10 years. Yeah. And if I hit the ball hard for the grill and just touched the wall and just curved it around uh, the tambour, people couldn't get it, but yeah. Gene could. And I just didn't react quickly enough. So when they criticised me quite rightly for this, I, I spluttered a bit and then... I, why didn't you go cross court? And I, and I eventually I said, well, I didn't think of it. And yeah. I've never forgotten that, you know, uh, you must, must, must adapt in the middle of matches if you find something's not working. And, uh, and, and, and what I was really good at, which was hitting a huge number of balls, either down to the into the grill or beneath the grill and, and nicking, which I like to do. Uh, that wasn't the way uh, uh, to, to try to play from the service end against Gene. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, I had various really serious um, rivals during the 70s at Real Tennis in the UK Norwood Cripps, Frank Willis, and then uh, towards the end of the uh, of the decade, Chris Ronaldson, and in the States, Jimmy Bostwick, Peter Bostwick, and Gene. Mm-hmm. And Pete and Jimmy and Norwood and Frank were better tennis players than I was, right. Right. but Gene wasn't. Mm-hmm. I was better than him a bit into the corners and with the and, and cut strokes where I wasn't as good as those other ones. So I, I didn't want to get into a game uh, in the corners and on the floor with the others. I wanted to set a pace where they couldn't do that. But with Gene, uh, uh, you, you, you hit the ball where he could get in and volley it at your peril, uh, but he wasn't great at digging the ball uh, from chase worse than a yard. Mm-hmm. He very seldom, uh, because he came from lawn tennis. He was very tall. He didn't bend. He didn't get underneath the ball with his wrist as well as somebody of his position in the world rankings. So I had to play a very, very different game, learn to play a very, very different game. Uh, against Gene than anybody else. Against all the others, I was trying to dictate how the game played. Mm-hmm. With Gene, I needed to, uh, and I was trying to do that with 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 pace most of the time. But with Gene, I needed to try to play like a tennis player, yeah. um, which was tricky. <laughs> Interesting. Well, I guess we being able to uh, to adjust your game is a skill in and of itself. And you yeah, I learned I learned against Gene from that uh, eliminator 
uh, to play uh, uh, Jimmy um, uh, Bostwick for the world title. I I, I, I learned and I realised, and um, uh, Judy, who was always my toughest but best coach, um, you know, she she made it quite clear that I got to I got to play well into the into the corners rather than try to um, just blast it. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, but he was lovely to play. Yeah. You know, I mean, as a, as a character, I mean, I was so lucky with the people that were my main rivals. Uh, uh, um, Willie Surtees um, at Rackets and Jimmy... Bostwick and Peter Bostwick and Jean and Frank and Norwood, the 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 the, the tough ones from a playing point of view um, were the rackets, one or two of the rackets players, Martin Smith, mm -hmm. uh, who was the best uh, 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 when I started to play uh, top top level uh, and. He was really tough competitor, and Willie Boone, who yeah. was brutal, you know, brutal uh, uh, as a. As he's the only person who's ever knocked me over as I walked from serving from one side to the other side. <laughs> I don't know why I, I, was in the, I, I must have been in the way as I uh, uh, as I walked. Uh, but I mean, he was he was really ultra competitive and that was his greatest asset was his i played i looked at it the other day i i completely forgotten this i played willie boone apparently in an eliminator to challenge willie surtees for the rackets mm -hmm. and i was it was a best of seven eliminator and I was three love and twelve three up, and managed to <laughs> to lose it. Uh, that must be that must be the most humiliating defeat I've ever I've ever had. You know, I don't I, I I'd forgotten that I'd forgotten that I was in the eliminator. Uh, uh, to be honest, um, uh, and you know, for quite a long while in the seventies, Willie Boone and John Pren were still improving, yeah. whereas my rackets was beginning to maybe uh, become secondary a bit to the to the real tennis, mm -hmm. uh, and I was maybe not spending quite so much time on it, and, and, and it was uh, not maintaining uh, the kind of improvement that they were making. Mm. Yeah. Um I'm, I'm going to go back to rackets a little bit. What was your fa what was your favorite court and your least favorite rackets court to play on? Well, it has to be Queens because we play the vast majority of the big tournaments there. Mm -hmm. So any big win that I had. Uh, I mean, obviously, uh, a lot of my worst losses would have been on the, to Willie on the Chicago court. Yeah. But it's not a court I didn't like. Uh, it was just happened to be you're up against uh, somebody as good as as, as Willie um, uh, on that court. But I, I, I it's, his, it's his home court too. I it guess wasn't so, a, yeah. I didn't have favorite and. Uh, courts I really didn't like. I mean, I used to go around uh, in the uh, late sixties a lot, playing in um, uh, against the schools um, in club matches, and uh, uh, I didn't really mind switching between one court and, and another. There is a danger if you play. 95% of all your matches, all your practice and everything, just on one court, that you become so ingrained with the angles and the pace and so on of that one court that you're not as good 
uh, at adapting to going to other courts. Mm-hmm. But because of uh, at both games, I was uh, uh, playing at lots and lots and lots of different courts. Um, you know, I used to uh, play a lot of rackets uh, up at Manchester. Yep. Which is a, a great, know, court. great court, great yep. court. Um, uh, but I can't remember thinking, God, I hate playing on this court when I was at X, Y or Z court. You know? yep. But Queen's was obviously was where I did most of my practice. I, I lived within uh, a five minute, 10 minute walk of, of Queen. So I used that for my uh, practice uh, uh, nearly all the time. Um, and uh, I think I've had my, my best wins at Queen's. You know. Fair answer, fair answer. Um, I think we've got, I've got two more questions for you. So the, the first one, I guess, is a little bit uh, of a, I guess, of a, in addition on to the last question, which is, did you, you know, going to the U.S. and the U.K., obviously, it's always a, a different um, thing to be having one serve rather than two. Did you feel like that affected you significantly, and which did you prefer? Yeah. Um, my, my fellow pros here in the U.K., I joined their ranks very late, as you know, uh, but most of them are either vehemently or slightly against one service. Um, I'm, I'm not, I'm not uh, sure, to be honest, and I would love it to have Uh, a series of top tournaments over here in the UK where we used to the two serve uh, playing with um, one service. The pros think that that the school boys will not, and the school girls now, will not learn to serve as well if they only have one serve. I would totally disagree with that, but I'm interested yeah, to hear your perspective. I, I, um, I think that a hell of a lot of players are profligate with their first serve. Mm-hmm. They serve ludicrously too many first service faults. And that's not necessary. I mean, we played the over 40s uh, championships at Queen's. Um, I don't know. 10 years or more ago with the one service rule must be more than 10 years ago with the one service rule just for the hell of it and if you'd watched Willie Boone and John Pren play in the final you you'd have been hard pressed to realize that uh it was a one service rule because they were serving like hell and they weren't serving Loads of faults. Yep. So at the time that uh, when I was chairman of the rackets committee uh, for the TNRA and I was coming towards the end of my uh, period of, of being right up uh, there, uh, I'm talking sort of late seventies now. Um, I would have quite liked to have suggested that we try some big tournaments with one serve rule. Mm-hmm. But you'd got the people that I was still trying to compete with, if not terribly effectively, were Willie Boone and John Prent who were, in their different ways, great servers. Um, And therefore, uh, I didn't feel that I could be too actively promoting uh, the idea of of trying some tournaments in one serve for fear that people would misinterpret it and think I was simply trying to uh, get a 
a personal uh, 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 benefit. But I would love to see what would happen here if if we tried it. It'd be interesting. I think for for me, the thing that I think the one serve rule benefits players because it it makes you be more accurate while still having to, you know, try to hit the ball hard and hit a good serve. Whereas with with the two serves, you can just get guys having poor technique, hammering it in. If it goes in great, it's a, you know, it could be an ace a lot of the time, but they'll fault, as you said, maybe 50% of the time or some, some high percentage. And then when they go over to the U.S., they're, they're hopeless. So it, and it, it creates a, a higher degree of skill um, to be having one serve, in my opinion, at least. Yeah. Well, when I played Willie Surtees in Chicago for the World Championship, when, when Jeffrey re uh, retired, uh, and, and we were the two people nominated, I had never played a game of rackets in the United States, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. I go straight into the World Championship uh, as my first game of rackets in, in the United States. And obviously one serve uh, rule was applying there and I'd never played that. I'd obviously been practicing to do it. And I, I got into the fourth game and I was 12-8 up. And I served and the strings went all over the place. I served a fault and, and lost, lost the point, obviously, and, and, and lost the game and therefore the match. Uh, so um, I have um, I've experienced the, 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 the trauma of the first, uh, the one service rule. But, um, you know, I, I think I only served two or three faults, and in a in a long four game match, um, you know, uh, that's that's bound acceptable. to happen. Yeah, yeah. It's bound yeah. to happen. Yeah. So the last question I had for you was regarding your switch to being a professional from being an amateur. How old were you when you switched? Well, I uh, uh, I worked in the motor industry from 1967 to 19. 93. And then uh, I was given the opportunity of going to Halebury as mm -hmm. their rackets coach uh, in 1996. So I was 52. Yeah. But I asked to remain as a amateur for real tennis. Uh, um, at, at that stage, you were automatically deemed to be a pro at both if you were a pro at one. And I said, well, yeah. you know, uh, uh, and, and James Mayle was doing the reverse he wanted to stay an amateur at rackets and become a pro at, at tennis and i was becoming a pro at rackets but wanted to remain an amateur at uh at, at um uh, at tennis and uh i stayed and i played another six years of amateur uh, pretty good rubbish tennis but I, I enjoyed it yeah um uh, and then when i went to queens obviously i had to give up um my amateur status for for lawn tennis uh, for uh, real tennis and uh so i was 58 when i uh when i <laughs> turned pro at, at uh at real tennis and uh, you know i was incredibly lucky to get that uh job at queens um uh, norwood Crips decided to retire early as the pro at Eton, and Eton uh, uh, appointed Peter Brake, who was the head pro at uh, Queens. So Queens were without a, a head rackets pro, and they either they wanted somebody who could do both games, play both mm -hmm. games, and contribute both games, and so they either had to. Uh, get somebody back who'd already done the job in the past, like Neil Smith or something like that, who wasn't going to come back to this country. Or they had to appoint somebody who was 20 years older than the guy who was leaving. So, you know, so uh, I, I was really lucky to, to, to get that job. David Norman rang me up and said, people are saying you might be the person for it to take over from Peter Brake and to be back at the very centre of 
tennis and rackets, from my point of view, was wonderful. You know, and now I'm sort of doing consultancy uh, um, uh, side of as, as technical advisor for for Chris Davis um, uh, on all sorts of things like eye protection and uh, lighting and uh, rackets balls and racket design and court repairs and uh, which I which I really enjoy keeps me in touch and and I until the pandemic I was going up to I live in North Bucks and I was going up to Queens you know a huge amount to help with the marking doing about half the marking of all the um, uh, championship matches which yeah. is great fun because it means I keep in touch with what the the players the top players are doing mm-hmm. so if they say to me how are any ideas I'm not saying well when I saw you play 18 months ago you know I said well last week I noticed this or that or whatever yeah. if they ask and um, uh, 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 so that's fun to to do the marking but how much longer they want me to do that I don't know so I, I think uh, as a as a young player and as basically a beginner when I went over a couple of years ago like a great opportunity for me was to meet you and I think we talked for probably a couple hours and wound up going down on court I can't I think it was with Christian um, at the time um, but you know, having having a person like you around there, bulk marking, refing, and giving tips is is a huge is a boon for the the community, and and I think everyone really appreciates your involvement and presence for sure. Well, it's it's it, it's been it's been a, a lovely to to um, to switch from the pretty tough motor industry to something as nice as uh, being involved in in both these games, which I've had so much enjoyment playing over the, over the years. So to to end up uh, at, at Queens was lovely, and uh, uh, I regard. The, the 12, 13 years that I did at, at Queen's as being a huge privilege, you know, it's wonderful. Fantastic. When are you uh, hoping to be over again? Are you got any, got any plans? Uh, once I this... do, yes. I, um, I'm, tr- I've, I'm trying to twist Stout's arm into partnering with me for the British Open in 2022. Um, he's committed verbally I'm putting it out, I guess, on the podcast now. So backing down would be just a terrible tragedy for the Rackets community, probably even more than it would be for me as a player. Um, so that that's the plan for me. And I always try to go to Manchester since it's a, a weekend tournament. Um, so I'm not sure if they'll be holding it over Halloween weekend as or around as usual, but I, I'd love to come for that. It would be yeah. it would be lovely if we can get back on court and 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 uh, and, and get you know the rackets uh, 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 up and running again. Obviously, it's more difficult than the real tennis, but uh, with the COVID. But um, that'd be lovely. And lovely if you could come over. And and do you think there's any chance that James might be persuaded to? uh take up some serious singles again i i unfortunately i don't think so i think uh his singles career is over i think on you know on one hand everyone would obviously love to see him play again but i think from from his perspective you know he still loves the doubles i think he's proven himself as a singles player there are other you know other guys that that are working their butts off to, to try to improve and, and are hungry for it. Um, and I think he, I, I don't want to speak for him, but I think that, you know, having now being in his mid to late thirties, he gets just as much pleasure out of being a coach as he did from winning matches and being a player. So I think that would presumably, you know, getting him to come over would be that, the coaching aspect of it would be part of the impetus to, to have, you know, come back again with a student of his to try to win matches. But I think, you know, just the, unfortunately the singles career, I think is over for him. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he was a, 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 a phenomenally uh, gifted uh, singles player. Uh, I still think he's 
um, about the quickest person around the court, uh, uh, particularly getting up the court, yeah. uh, just fantastic. Uh, and interestingly, I mean, when he beat Harry Foster for the World Championship, um, I am sure if you had a video of it, which we sadly don't have, uh, that he hit more than half the balls above the service line. That's probably a, a decent expectation, yeah. Uh, but to a wonderful length. Yep. He wasn't smashing it all the way around the back walls. He, you know, it was dying off the back wall, even though it had gone up quite high. Um, so he, at that stage, he wasn't using the serve uh effectively. Uh, I mean, he was starting rallies almost like a squash player. Yeah. Um, and I remember saying to him, which he commented to me just a couple of years ago, um, I said at some stage, you know, you're going to need your serve. And he developed up some wonderful, wonderful serves. He's um, the best server in the world, in my opinion, now. I mean, I've yeah, I all mean, all just, just, gonna... just, just fantastic. Uh, but I also saw him stand in the middle of the court and do what I call a, 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 an Alex Titchener Barrett, just hit the ball incredibly hard so that people can't, uh, they can't live with the pace. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so he could, he could do that if he wished to. And I said, just think how devastating it would be if you combine the two. But he didn't actually need to. No, he's tougher to play when he keeps it short and soft, I, like for, for sure. Yeah. I mean, 100%. he could, uh, 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 he was able to win whatever number of hundred and something singles matches in a, in a row or something. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, without having to combine two alternative ways of playing the game with finesse and with brute power. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you put the two together, uh, it would have been uh, just overwhelming. I mean, he was pretty much overwhelming anyway, you know. Yeah, and, and, and it would have been so great had he and James Mayle overlapped a bit more, you know. Uh, they're a they're of a similar that. era, but, yeah. but, but, but they didn't, you know. Yeah. <laughs> well, Howard, I really appreciate your time. Um, this was really a treat for me, and I think everyone who watches the podcast is really going to enjoy this. Um, we're, we have Willie Boone lined up for next week on Thursday uh, and John Pren thereafter. And then all the rest of the world champions, um, I think in order, we'll try to do them um, going after that. So look out for, for those interviews. And uh, I hope to be seeing you in person sooner rather than later. That that would that would be lovely. Um, uh, it, 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 it's been a great pleasure to uh, to chat to you. And uh, as you say, uh, I look forward to us uh, maybe uh, uh, sitting on the terrace at Queens and having a further chin wag. I'd I'd like nothing more than that. Howard, take care. Appreciate it. Take care. Bye for now.